Matthew chapter 6. Pick up verse 5. It says, And when you pray, Jesus speaking, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you've shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will, will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard uh, for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. And so uh, we're studying through what's called the Sermon on the Mount. We've been in it now for a few weeks. It was given by Jesus to his disciples. Um, and now we're looking at the section that he brings up regarding prayer. And just as a reminder, Jesus is teaching uh, his followers what they're supposed to look like as his followers, how we're supposed to represent Christ and his kingdom in this world. And Matthew chapter 6 basically deals with our outward actions um, as disciples of Jesus Christ. And Jesus covers some very important spiritual disciplines that are supposed to be part of our life. They're to be part of our life. The first one we covered last week was charitable deeds. This week and next week, we'll be looking at prayer and the model prayer. And then the following week, Lord willing, we'll be looking at fasting. But the reason Jesus touches on these topics is because these were things that were practiced by the scribes and Pharisees um, along with their disciples. But what Jesus is going to do is he's going to show us how they practice these things in an improper way, how they were in error in practicing these things. And then he's going to show up, go on to show us um, the way that is important for us as disciples to practice these things in our lives. And so he, he outlines for us how he wants us to do these things. And Jesus wants um, us to engage in these activities. He wants us to be doing these activities in a way that's profitable, in a way that honors God in the spiritual realm. And so, as I said, this week we're going to be focusing in on what Jesus, uh, his teachings on the do's and don'ts of prayer. And you know, what better teacher is there to have teach us about prayer than Jesus Christ himself, right? Who on earth knows more about approaching the Father the proper way than our Savior? And apart from the subject of salvation, I think the topic of prayer is probably the most important topic we can learn about. I don't know. I, I think so, don't you? Prayer has got to be the most important thing because as believers, we're called to this relationship with the Father. We're called to a relationship with Almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's just so amazing. We're called to commune with the Father. And it's impossible, maybe you've tried it, I don't know, but it's impossible to have a close personal relationship with anyone apart from good communication. Um, and that's really what prayer is. No relationship is stronger than the degree that that communication between the two parties are um, engaged in. For a healthy, for a relationship to be healthy, strong, to be deep, to be intimate, there needs to be good communication. And that's what Jesus desires for us. He desires this wonderful relationship with the Father. That's what he wants for us. 
And we have the Bible, which is God's word to us. And as we read it, we respond to him in prayer, right? God speaks to us through his word, and we speak to him through prayer. And it's a conversation. It becomes this dialogue, and it leads to a healthy relationship. You know, when Tina and I first met, when we first started dating, you know, we spent a lot of time talking, and maybe you had a similar experience with your wife or your husband when you guys were dating, but we spent time talking on the phone. You know, it's the, the typical, uh, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. You hang up. Okay, we'll hang up on three. One, two, three. Tina, hello? <laughs> she hung up. What you, you know what I mean? I mean, we did all kind. We did everything just to be together, and we just talked. We, you know, I... I poured out my heart to her. She poured out her heart to me. We would take picnics and we would just talk. Hey, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite food? Where's your favorite place to, to go on a vacation? And, uh, you know, the more we talked, the more we got to know each other, the deeper in love we fell. And uh, you, you guys know what I mean. You, you know what I'm talking about. I hope you understand what I mean, right? Yeah, okay, thanks a lot. There's one happy couple over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what, it, that's what it's about. For a relationship to grow deep, for it to grow intimate, you know, there has to be good communication. And the same thing is true with our relationship with God the Father. And Jesus wants us to know how we can grow in that relationship with him. And prayer is an important part of that proper relationship with God the Father. Verse 5, Jesus says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. As surely I say to you, they have their reward. And the first thing you want to notice is that Jesus assumes that we're going to be praying, that we're going to be engaged in this activity of prayer. Jesus says, When you pray, not if you pray. And if you look at your Bibles, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, he repeats it. He says, when you pray, Jesus naturally assumes that every single one of us as a follower of Jesus Christ are going to be engaged in praying. Every person is going to be actively involved in this discipline of prayer. And again, he says, not if you pray, but when you pray. David, Psalm 32, verse 6, he says, everyone who is godly shall pray to you. And, you know, I just ask you again just to be real, just to be open. I would ask you, when's your time of prayer with the Lord? If you're like me, you know, if I don't schedule time to sit and pray with the Lord, if you're like me, you know what, my day is so busy. If I don't schedule that time, my day's over before I even stop to pray. It just goes by so fast. Prayer is always the first thing that seems to get bumped in a busy schedule, a busy day, and if, and if you don't make time to stop and pray, then you know, like I said, the day's over. And maybe this is a time that each one of us could take the opportunity and just evaluate our life. I mean, I wake up at this time, I go to work at this time, I eat my lunch at this time, I come home, I eat dinner at this time, I sit down and watch TV this time, and I go to bed. When is there a good time for you to get alone with the Lord and just pray, just seek his face? And it doesn't have to be two or three hours, you know. Maybe just start planning a 15-minute session. Get up a little early, 15 minutes. Open up your Bible and just spend time with the Lord. I can remember one time I used to do the men's ministry at, at our church in Oregon, and, and we scheduled a retreat at Applegate Christian Fellowship. And uh, John was teaching this one particular session. And I remember he said at the end of the session, when we're done here, what I want you to do is I don't want you to talk to anybody. I just want you to grab your stuff. I want you to just get up, go outside, and find a quiet place, just you and the Lord, and I want you to pray for the next hour. And so, you know, I got my stuff. I walked out. I, I, walked out, I, I found a place all by myself. I can remember exactly where it was. And, um, you know, I just began seeking the Lord's face. And after what I thought was about an hour, 
I look down at my watch. Five minutes. Oh, my goodness. This is harder. Than, I mean, it's a discipline, right? Prayer is a discipline that we grow into. And I can't tell you how much I want us to be a, a church that prays. I mean, that is my constant prayer, that we would be a church that prays. I ask the setup team. I ask the worship team. I ask everybody that's involved in ministry. Before we do anything, let's just pray over it. I want to bathe everything in prayer. I heard somebody say one time that there's a whole lot of good you can do after you pray, but there's not a lot of good you can do until you pray. And you know that stuck with me. So can I encourage you, just set a time aside where you can just get away with the Lord and just pray and just develop this um, habit of prayer, this discipline. And I don't want to insult anybody here today, um, but sometimes I think that there's a little bit of confusion in regards to prayer. You know, people, they can be afraid to pray in a group setting. Um, our church in Oregon, we, uh, when we got to be about a, a thousand people, we decided we were a mobile church. We decided, you know what, right after worship, what we'll do is we'll just have everybody turn their chairs around, just get in groups of six to eight, and just spend 10, 15 minutes praying, praying for each other, praying for um, the study. And uh, you know what? It was like almost overnight, we lost 200 people. People were just afraid to pray in a group setting. What they would do is they would sit in their cars, they would wait for a worship to be over, and then when the study started, they would, they'd come streaming in. And uh, yeah, you know, people, they, they just, they're embarrassed. They're intimidated. They're like, you know what? I don't pray very well with others. But prayer is just talking to God. You know, when our kids were little, they would never come to me and say, Oh, high and exalted Father, I beseech thee for five dollars so that I could quench my thirst with a bottle of Gatorade. You know how thy servant suffers in this thine heat. Please, please, would you in your holy generosity provide for thy servant's a desire. You know, if, if my kids came up to me like that, I would say, who are you? What did you do with my kids? You know, they don't do that, right? What do they do? They come up and say, hey, Dad, can I have some money? I want to go grab a Gatorade. Is that okay? You know, that, that's the way they talk to their father. They don't use King James English. Um, do, doesn't work that way. You know, we just need to talk to God that way as a loving father. And the greatest thing is, of all is, you know what? I don't, have to, I don't have to speak out loud. Talking to God, I can just bow my head and speak to him in the quietness of my heart because he hears my heart. And prayer is just that. It's just this conversation with God. I speak to him. He hears me. He speaks to me. I listen and I receive and I make um, efforts to apply those things that he says to me, it's just that simple. It's just a dialogue. And it's like talking to a best friend. Um, you know, my, my best friend, one of my best friends, God has blessed me like four or five best friends, really great guys that have surrounded me through the years. And I just talked the other day to my best friend. He pastors at Calvary in, in Gilbert, Arizona. And I haven't spoken to him for a while, but it's like we never stop speaking. You know, and I don't change my tone of voice, my voice when I speak to him. I don't use big words, you know what, I just talk to him, and he loves me, he knows who I am, he loves me, and we just have this great relationship, but then that's not to say that somebody that does pray with great eloquence, somebody that does pray with, you know, passion and, and a certain forcefulness, that's not to say that they're praying in a wrong way that they're not praying in a conversational way. That may be the way they have a conversation with God. That may be what their relationship looks like with God. But what I am saying is when we go to God in prayer, we should never try to look like somebody that we're not. We come to the Lord in prayer. We just need to be transparent. We need to be humble. We need to understand that it blesses the Lord when we speak to him, when we pray. 
He wants to hear from each one of us. He wants to hear uh, from us. He wants to have this dialogue with us as any loving father wants to have a dialogue with their children. There was a tremendous price to pay. Jesus paid this tremendous price so that we could have this relationship where we could just talk openly and honestly with the Father. And so what Jesus does, he says here, you know, his desire to instruct us on how to pray, what he says is, don't pray like the hypocrites. And then Jesus goes on to expose two great problems that he had with the scribes and the Pharisees when they prayed. The first one was that they were seeking recognition from men. And the second one was um, they were uh, using vain repetitions. And as they were doing this, they were doing these things. They were, they were just hypocritical in the way they did it. And so Jesus says, for they, speaking of the scribes and Pharisees, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Now, we shouldn't misunderstand uh, what Jesus is saying here. Again, he's not condemning public prayer because Jesus prayed publicly, right? John chapter 6, when he fed the 5,000, what does he do? He takes the, uh, the, the, the loaves and he took them and he gave thanks for them. That means he prayed. He prayed out loud, thanking God for the food that was provided. He gave thanks for them. He distribu distributed it to the disciples. The disciples then distributed it to those that were sitting down. And likewise, he did with the fish as many as, as the people wanted. So he prayed publicly. He thanked God publicly for the fish. Remember Lazarus' tomb, John 11 says that Jesus lifted his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me, and I know you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. <clears throat> so Jesus prayed publicly. Jesus even prays when he was on the cross. Remember, he said aloud, publicly, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. I think of Acts chapter 1, 12 and 14, after Jesus' Jesus' resurrection. The, the disciples and about 120 other people, they got together in the upper room, and it says, continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. So they were praying publicly in this group setting. And as a church, of course, we pray publicly. We're out here in the park for everyone to see us. We open our service with prayer. We pray. We close our service with prayer. So Jesus can't be condemning public prayer. That's not what he's saying here. There's nothing wrong for me walking down the street, lifting my day up to the Lord in prayer. There's nothing wrong for us to walk down the street to the coffee shop, you know, downtown just praying and asking the, the Lord to just bless us, thanking Him for His goodness and His grace in our lives, as long as, and this is the point, as long as we don't do it in a way that draws attention to ourselves. And that's what Jesus is condemning here. He's condemning the habit of the scribes and the Pharisees of praying in such a way that it drew attention to them. Now, to just understand maybe a little bit about the Jewish traditions, a little bit of background, there were certain times of prayer in the Jewish traditions. The first was twice a day, every Jew would say the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord God with all your uh, heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and so on. And so twice a day, they would say the Shema. The Hebrew word for hear in hear, O Israel, the Hebrew word is Shema, and that's why it's called the Shema. And they would say the full Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and they would say it before 9 a.m., and they would say it at 9 p.m. They'd say it twice a day. And no matter where they were, if for some reason they were out on the street at 9 p.m., they would stop, and they would say the Shema. And then they also recited... Now, I'm going to probably butcher this, but they also recited the Shemone Esra, which is it's the Hebrew word for 18. 
And it was the custom of Jews that they would recite these 18 prayers three times a day. They would do it at 9 a.m., they would do it at noon, and they would do it at 9 p.m. And you can imagine how these beautiful prayers, how over time what happened was they just became mechanical in nature, right? Maybe it's something that would be equivalent to it in our cultures is uh, I wasn't raised in a Catholic background, but if you were raised in a Catholic background, it'd be something like maybe reciting an Our Father. You know, like I said, my friend in Gilbert, Arizona, he was raised in a Catholic background. He told me one time he could say 10 Our Fathers and 10 Hail Marys in a heartbeat. You know, there's just, it became a mechanical, it became a formula, it became just a meaningless exercise. It's just something that you did. No heart or brain involved in it. You just did it because that's what you do. And the original intent of these prayers, it was beautiful. Stopping to remember how great God has been to you three times a day. It's just a beautiful thing. But again, the nature of mankind is such that it became another mindless task to do. And so in the Jewish tradition, the synagogue was a place that was... Um, a place of prayer. And so the Jews, they also taught, and here's a quote from a couple of rabbis. They taught, they tended towards longer prayers. Uh, one rabbi said, whoever is, long in, whoever is long in prayers is heard. Another rabbi said, whenever the righteous make their prayers long, their prayers are heard. You know, so all of this set the stage for prayer to be used as a tool to be seen by others making me look righteous. And so uh, the two places that these uh, scribes and Pharisees, they would be uh, known to, they knew that these two places were certain that people would see them when they stopped in prayer was the synagogue and the streets. And so in the synagogue, the custom was, and you read about it in Acts where they ask Paul, hey, does anybody here have a word? You know, or they'd ask somebody to pray. And uh, during the meeting, you know, maybe Brother Solomon would get up and this was his chance to make, make a name for himself, maybe a chance to shine. So he'd bust out with his great, expansive, ongoing, never stopping, putting people to sleep type of prayer. And, and uh you guys maybe have experienced something like that. They, were, they just filled their prayers with empty words so that they would sound eloquent. And then the other place where the scribes and Pharisees would offer these long hypocritical prayers again were the street corners. And what the scribes and Pharisees, what they tended to do was they would plan their travel to the synagogue in such a way that when the time of prayer came by, they just happened conveniently to be on a corner and they would stop and they would raise their hands there, and they would just give these great verbose prayers. And again, here's a prayer, and I'll quote it for you. I'm reading straight from, straight from, uh, yeah, the, the uh, Mishnah here. Oh God, blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honor, and lauded be the name of the Holy One, and on and on and on. They would attach 15, 16, 18 different adjectives to the name of God, and the result would people would be that people would see that and say, ooh, oh, man, look how holy that guy is. I mean, geez, he can't, he's so righteous, he can't even wait to get to the synagogue. He's just got to stop and raise his hands and pray right now. What a spiritual guy that guy is. And Jesus said they love to pray standing in the synagogues, and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen by men. They loved the attention that they received, and they couldn't get enough of it. They wouldn't, and, and they wouldn't pray to be heard by God, but they were praying to be seen by men. And you know, not to be too hard on anyone, but you know what? It's kind of a something similar that we see in our culture today, actually, with prayer. One of the temptations and public prayer is not being transparent with God, looking like we're more spiritual than maybe we, we really are. You know, we want to see 
spiritual and together in the eyes of other people. And so, you know, somebody might pray something like, Oh, Lord, you know that it's a difficult situation between Sally and myself. You know, I'm trying so very hard to make it work, and I need your help. I need your strength. I need your love. When in reality, it's more like, Lord, you know Sally gets on my nerves. If you don't do something, I'm going to lose it. You know, we try to just seem a little bit more together. You know, God sees our hearts. We should be transparent with him, and we should not try to candy coat things so that others will think better of us. You know, I think another common problem that we face in our culture with prayer is people, again, in an effort to look spiritual, they use prayer as a platform to gossip. Oh, Lord, you know that I saw Jimmy with that other woman. You know his wife doesn't know they're hanging out. I don't know, Lord, only you know what they're doing down at that bar late at night. And I just want to lift that cheating Jimmy up to you, Lord, and just ask you to minister to him. You know, people do it. You know, when it comes to public prayer, people often want to use the time to teach others or to impress others. And there's this, there's this story of D.L. Moody. If you don't know who D.L. Moody is, he's a, probably one of the greatest American evangelists, 1850s. And uh, he had a crusade. The story goes, crusade came to town. And so Moody asked this one gentleman to pray during their meeting. And this guy gets up, you know, and uh, the story goes on. He gets up and he starts to pray. And this guy goes on and on, you know, it's his time to shine. Maybe he thought that, you know, if he did a good job, Moody would ask him to be part of his team. I don't know. But uh, after several minutes of this wordy prayer, D.L. Moody, who he had a concern for souls, and he saw that this guy was just killing the meeting. D.L. Moody stands up. He walks up to the podium. He puts his arm around the brother, and he says very loud, while our brother continues his prayer, let us turn to him number. And he gives a number, and they just began singing a song. You know, <laughs> it's just hilarious. These types of prayers, they're not offered up to the Lord because they believe in the power of prayer. They just, these people, they just want others to think that they're like a super Christian or something like that. And Jesus is saying, if you offer up a prayer and an effort to appear spiritual in the eyes of others, then the oohs and the ahs that you get, man, you got it. There you go. There's no, there's no answers coming your way from those prayers because you're not seeking the Lord for an answer. You're just trying to impress people. So there's no reward in heaven for such prayers like that. Jesus says in verse 6, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you've shut the door, pray to your father who's in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And again, Jesus says, but you, in contrast to the hypoc in hypocrites, but you, when you pray, again, Jesus expects us to pray. Luke 18, 1, Jesus said that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. He expects us to pray. And just a quick Bible survey, you know what? Paul, under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit, he wrote to the church at Thessalonia. And what did he say? He said, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And Paul encouraged all the churches. Romans 12, 12, he says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Colossians 4, 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. We're to be in this constant attitude of prayer, constant in constant communication with our Heavenly Father. And, you know, Proverbs, the book of wisdoms, what does it tell us? Again, I mentioned this uh, verse, I think it was last Thursday. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That's a reference to prayer. That's a reference to prayer in every situation, in every path of life. And he goes on and he gives us this sure promise. 
if we'll acknowledge him, says he will direct our paths. And you know what? My favorite, all-time favorite prayer verse, Psalm 62, 8. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. I mean, we're to pour out our heart. What do you think about when you, when you hear that pouring out your heart? You know, when I was a kid, my best friend growing up was Bob Neal. And I ate dinner at the Neal's house probably as frequently as I ate dinner at my own house. And when I was younger, I had a problem, you know. Um, I had a spilling problem. It seemed like every meal, right, and, and I just want to calm your mind. I've, I've overcome that problem. I've grown out of it. I don't spill much anymore. Uh, but every meal, you know, I'd reach, reach for something, and I'd knock over a glass of milk. I'd knock over a glass of water. It didn't even matter where it was. It was going down. And that milk, it poured out of that glass. It came out fast, and it went every place. It never just trickled out. It was never just a drop or two that spilled out when I knocked over that glass. You know, and that's what God is encouraging us to do as his believers, is just pour out your heart. Don't be a miser. Don't just let a trickle come out of your heart. Don't just let a drop or two come out of your heart. I mean, you're to take your heart and tip it over and just pour it out, pour it all out to him. And why should we do that? Because there's a promise here. Well, it's not so much a promise. It's more of an encouragement. Psalm 62, 8. Why should we do it? Because it says, God is a refuge for us. Selah. Selah means think about that. Take time to meditate on that. We're to pour out our hearts in, in a very real way, not holding back. We're to pour out our hearts to God through our just conversation with him. We're to be transparent. We're to be genuine. We're to be honest with our heavenly father. And Jesus, he goes on to say, when you pray, go into your room. And the Greek word there, it's so beautiful. I didn't know it until I studied for this study. The Greek word there for room, would, it was used to speak of a storeroom where treasures were held, where treasures were kept. And this reminds us that there's treasures waiting for us when we take time to get alone and pray. And again, Jesus, he's not prohibiting public prayer. You know, but what he's doing is he's reminding us that our prayers should always be directed to God and not to men. When we pray, we should have no thought on our mind, you know, nothing in our heart, but just God. Jesus continues, he says, when you shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret. And the promise is that our God will see. Our God's going to see. And it's inferred that he's going to hear because we're to go into that private place because that's where God will meet us. It's a promise. And again, for me, it's just like, how crazy is that? You know, the God of the universe is willing to meet with me. God is looking forward to meeting you where it can just be you and him alone where you can just talk. You know, I just want you to just allow that to sink into your heart. God is just looking for an opportunity for you two to get alone and just talk. God wants to meet with you and he wants to talk with you. He says, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And we know this is true, that, that the Father sees, because we read it in the Bible. God sees when, when we pray. Open your Bibles real quick to Acts chapter 9. You remember Acts chapter 9. G, uh, Paul, Saul of Tarsus at the time, he's going to Damascus, and he sees the shining light, and he speaks with the risen Savior, and what does it say? Acts chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. It says, talking to, you know, the Lord speaking to Ananias. He says, now 
there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. He said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise, go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. You know, it's, it's very important that we see God saw Saul of Tarsus praying. But beyond that, there's actually so much more for us to, to see. God not only saw him praying, but God also saw exactly where he was when he was praying. God knew the street. He said, go to the street called Straight. He knew the house that Paul was praying in. He said, go to the house of Judas. He knew the owner of the house. It was Judas. You know what? I just love it. God sees and he wants to meet us when we pray. Flip back over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, you know the story. When uh, Jesus for the first time meets Nathaniel. John chapter 1, verses 47 and 48. John's such an awesome gospel. Boy, I can't wait till we get to dig into it. But John chapter 1, verse 47 and 48. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom th there is no guile. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, the phrase under the fig tree it was a Jewish idiom for prayer. Jesus took notice of Nathanael when he was praying. And dear brothers and sisters, boy, please allow me to encourage you today. You know, the Father hears your prayers. He, he meets each one of us when we pray. Jesus hears your prayers. He sees you when you're praying. Now, you know, please don't be tempted to think, you know, your prayers are just a waste of time if you don't immediately see some answer to them because it's not true. The Father hears and He takes note. And we need to remember that our God is a God of love. Our God is, is one who's more than ready to answer us when we pray. His gifts and His grace are not something that we have to extract from Him. Our God um, is not a God that we must that must be coaxed or pestered or battered into answering our prayers. You know, when we pray, we come to the one who's the one who wishes to give to us. God wishes to give to us. And we need to understand and we need to rest in the knowledge that every good and perfect gift, you know, comes from him. And it allows us with that understanding to wholeheartedly say at the end of our prayer, Lord, your will be done. Your will, not mine. And Jesus, he then continues. I mean, for me, it's just getting better and better and better. He continues with the promise. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You know, I'm not sure exactly what that reward is going to be. I, I know um, that when you're a person given over to prayer, people often will come to you with prayer requests. And when you pray for them with the right heart and you intercede for them, you have the privilege of seeing God move firsthand. You know, I've seen amazing doors open up through prayer. I've seen people healed through prayer. I can remember one time um, my friend asked me to pray for his daughter. We were at a men's Bible study early in the morning. And he asked me to pray for his daughter. She was very sick. And he told me the next day that he went home after the Bible study and his wife said his daughter was better. And he said, when did she get better? And it was exactly the time we were praying. And you know what? It's just a wicked heart, right? I said, really? What did I pray? <laughs> it's not a formula. It's not a cookbook. When we pray, God just wants us to pray. And if we'll pray with a whole heart given over to him, man, we'll see great things. I've seen People get saved through prayer. People that we've labored in prayer over. The great reward of prayer is seeing God move mightily 
through those prayers. You know, the, the great reward of prayer very well may be when we look Jesus in the eye, we see him face to face, that we get to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I mean, don't you just long to hear those words? You know, whatever, whatever else the reward may be, the, the promise that Jesus gives us is that God himself, it's God himself, God Almighty, the creator of the universe himself is going to reward us openly. Well, Jesus goes on, verse 7, says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that, think that they'll be heard for their many words. When we pray, Jesus says, we're not to use vain or empty repetitions and pray them over and over and over again, again with no heart, no mind. Um, you know, it's just mechanical. That's what Jesus is condemning here. It's vain repetition. It's not repetition, right? Jesus prayed three times to the Father, Lord, if it's your will, let this cup pass. You know, nevertheless, not my will be done, your will be done. He prayed that three times. So it can't mean that repetition is wrong. Paul prayed three times that he would have this thorn in his flesh removed. 2 Corinthians 12, 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that, I might, that it might depart from me. And what, it, what was the Lord's answer? He said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Repetition is not a problem. The problem is vain, empty repetition. That's what's wrong. There's nothing wrong with it when we're faced with a, a terrible, horrific situation. You know, a, a loved one is hurt or there's an accident or whatever the case may be. Just, there's nothing wrong with us just, oh, Jesus, Jesus, help, 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 Jesus, please. Jesus, will you help, please? There's nothing wrong with that because, you know, there's power in the name of Jesus. And if your heart is right, the Father hears and answers. It's not the number of words that we use, Jesus is telling us here. It's not the number of words we use in our prayers that gets God to take notice. It's our heart. I think an example is when Peter, uh, when Jesus came to the disciples walking on the water, remember the story, Matthew chapter 14, uh, the disciples, they were afraid. They see Jesus. They think he's a ghost. You know, and, and Jesus speaks to them. What does he say? He says, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And if you don't know this, boy, underline those phrases because the most commonly recorded phrase of Jesus, our Savior, is do not be afraid. You know, fear not. I love it. But verse 28 and 29, Peter answers him. You know the story and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus says to him, come. And Peter, when he had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And what, is, what do we read Jesus does at that moment? He says, do you call that a prayer? Three words, that's all you got? You want me to save you? That's it? No, that's not what he says. What, what does it say? It says in verse 31, when Peter prayed sincerely from his heart, it says, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. The length of the prayer is not what matters to the Lord. It's the weight of the prayer that's important to our Savior. Hey, turn over. You're in Matthew chapter 6. Flip over to Matthew 15 real quick. Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. You know the story. The woman, she comes to Jesus. Mark tells us that she's a, I think it's Mark, tells us that she's a Syrophoenician woman, right? She comes to Jesus and she says, Have mercy, O Lord, Son of David. My daughter is sincerely demon-possessed. And again, this woman, she wasn't Jewish. She was a Canaanite. There was a curse on the Canaanites, as you know. So what she's doing, though, is she's using these titles, these Jewish titles, 
of the Messiah. You know, son of David. I mean, there were things that were actually meaningless to her in, in her culture, right? And she's using these words of some promised leader of the Jewish people. They were empty. And Jesus, verse 24, says to her, you know, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it sounds kind of harsh, but what Jesus is doing is drawing out her faith. And in verse 24, uh, sorry, verse 25, she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And it's so beautiful. The word translated worship there, it's the Greek word proskuneo. And it's a picture of somebody falling upon their knees and touching their forehead to the ground. And just this expression of profound worship. But literally, the word, if you translate it literally, what it means is to turn and kiss. And that's what worship is. We turn and kiss the face of God. We turn and, and kiss his, his hands, his feet. And she just simply from her heart says, Lord, help me. And you know, the Lord responds. Praying long prayers happens to be something that false religious people do. I think of 1 Kings 18, the 450 prophets of Baal, they're cutting themselves, they're praying, they're screaming, they're trying to get Baal's attention for half a day. I think of Acts chapter 19, verse 34, the mob there in Ephesus chanting, screaming, great is the devil. What is it she say? Great is the goddess, you know, great is Diana of the Ephesians. That's what they say. And they say it for two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You know, we don't have to wake up our God. His eyes are ever upon us. He's so in love with each one of us. We never cease to be the object of his attention. We never have to motivate him to move on our behalf. He's always eager to do good for us. But again, human nature is a little bit funny, isn't it? If someone comes to us and, and asks us for prayer, you know, their child has a cold, you know, we might pray something like, Lord, would you, would you please just touch this little child, heal him of their cold, help him feel better, in Jesus' name, amen. But then when somebody comes and asks for prayer and they've been diagnosed with cancer, the big C, oh my goodness, dear Heavenly Father, all-powerful God, you see what the cancer is doing to their body. Oh, Father, in your mercy. I mean, we get all worked up. We go on and on and on. Like healing cancer is significantly harder for the all-powerful God than healing a cold, right? Nothing. No thing is too hard for our God. It's all little to him. And sometimes, you know, people will get upset. They'll come up and ask the pastor for prayer, you know. And sometimes, you know, you just feel just led to, to pray a simple prayer. Lord, would you touch my brother? Would you touch my sister? Would you comfort them and heal them? In Jesus' name, amen. And, you know, sometimes they get upset. That's all you got? That's all I got. <laughs> you know what? Long prayers filled with big words don't impress God. He's interested in our heart. God wants more of our heart than he wants of our tongue. To God, the most eloquent prayer of all is one that consists of heartfelt desire and simple faith. Verse 8 Jesus says, therefore, in light of this, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. He says, don't be like the hypocrite, those who worship false gods. Don't be like them. We're to trust in. We're to rest in. We're to be confident in the fact that our God, the very God who encourages us to pray, is the one true living God who answers prayer. You know what? That's something that has stuck with me for the years. Our God that encourages us to pray is the very God that hears and answers prayers. He knows what we have need of before we ask Him. But He wants us to ask. 
He wants us to come to him in prayer and spend time with him in sweet communion. We're not to dictate or direct God and how he's supposed to act in our behalf. You know what? He's not a genie. He's not a servant of ours. Prayer is where we come and we pour out our hearts to him and we make our requests made known to him. Prayer is the primary tool in our lives, I think, that he uses to align us with his heart. You know, the, the thing that I, is in my mind all the time is you just picture a, a great big, you know, aircraft carrier. And you're in a little rowboat. And there's a rope between the two of you. And you begin to tug on that rope. Which one moves, the aircraft carrier or your rowboat? Well, the aircraft carrier actually does move, but it's imperceptible to your movement. But that's the way it works is we just go to the Lord in prayer. What happens is he moves us in line. He moves us closer. He gets us where he wants us to be. Well, we're going to have to leave it here today. We're not going to finish everything. We're going to look at the prayer next week, um, the model prayer. But you know, when you talk about prayer, a lot of people can feel condemned. You know, a lot of people can say, man, you know what, I'm not praying enough. You know, I'm not praying at all. I, I don't have prayer time or a place where I pray. You know, I'm such a bad Christian. You know, the purpose is not to condemn anybody. The purpose is to challenge you. You know what, if that's the way you feel, you know, don't be condemned. Just do something about it. You know, start a prayer time tomorrow, 10, 15 minutes. You know, start it tomorrow. If you're anything like me, if you don't purpose in your heart to pray the first thing in the morning again, man, the day will just go by. And at the end of the day, it's just, I remember, boy, I didn't pray today. You know, David said, oh, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. So you know what I do is I just wake up a little earlier. That's my time of prayer. That's my time of being in the Word. The phone's not ringing. When the kids were younger, the kids weren't, you know, demanding my attention. And so it was a great time. At first it was hard for me. But, you know, over time it just becomes part of your DNA. It becomes part of who you are as a Christian, who you are as a follower of Jesus Christ. So, you know, my heart would challenge us as a church Let's be praying people. Let's be a praying church. Someone once said, the church goes forward on her knees. And, and, you know, I believe that's true. I believe that you believe that's true. I remember one time a missionary came and spoke at our church in Oregon. And I'll never forget what she said. She said, I used to think that prayer was a big part of the ministry. Then I realized prayer is the ministry. And boy, I've just found that to be true. I know if we'll pray, if we'll seek God as his people, God will do a work in this town of Truckee. And boy, you know what? That's what I'm longing to see. I've told people this weekend, just a couple people is like, I've never experienced God's call on my life in that, Gary, you're going to be an elder in the church, or Gary, I'm calling you to be a missionary, or Gary, I'm calling you to be a pastor. Nothing like that was ever my life. My life, the call is always, Gary, I'm going to do a work. You want to see it? Let's go. That's my call, and I know if we'll be a praying people, God will do a work in this town. We'll see people get saved. If we pray, God will use this little church to impact the world. We'll impact this town. We'll impact the world. He'll use us to expand the, the kingdom of God. He'll use this little church if we'll commit to pray. It's a promise. You know, and my encouragement to us as a church is let's commit us, ourselves to prayer and see what God will do. Now, just in closing, I want to just say this. If you're not a believer, if you're here today and you're not a believer, you're not walking with the Lord, you need to know what the Bible says in regards to you in prayer. So, uh, Proverbs 28, 9 says, One who turns away from hearing the law 
Even his prayer is an abomination. Trying to approach God on your own terms, praying when you have no desire to have a relationship with God, to God, that's distasteful. It's disgusting. But don't get the wrong idea. God very much wants to have a relationship with you. You know? But what has to occur first is you need to agree with God that you've sinned, that you've fallen short. You need to ask him to forgive you and cleanse you of your sins. You need to tell him that you believe in Jesus Christ, that he died in your place, taking your sins, and the third day rose again. That's a prayer that God will receive wholeheartedly. and That's a prayer that he'll welcome. And that's a prayer that he'll move on. If you're willing to repent from your sins, turn away from a sinful lifestyle, and turn towards God, you know what? God will embrace you. The Bible says that Jesus will come into your heart, fill you with his spirit, and give you the power to live for him. Your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life, and you know, you'll go to heaven. And my, my advice to anybody that may be here that's not a believer is, wouldn't you receive the Lord today? Why not be cleansed today? Why not be forgiven of your sins? Have that slate white clean today. Why not receive new life today? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the instruction on prayer. and Pray, Lord, you would just let it go deep into our hearts and and create in us that which you desire to see in us, Lord. Make us men and women in prayer. Lord, for anybody here that is feeling condemned, Lord, I pray that they would just turn to you and do something about it and be received by you. Lord, if there's a person here that doesn't know you, that would like to be forgiven of their sins, Lord, I pray you give them courage just to bow their, their heart right now and ask you to come into their life. Forgive them and embrace them, Lord, and make them a new creation as you promised. Lord, we ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, listen, if, if you've asked the Lord to come into your heart or you would like to uh, receive forgiveness of your sin, grab, grab me after the service. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's talk it over. Let's talk it through and See what God will do in your life. Amen.